Hey everybody, Steve here, and uh, we're going to go over the Matthew chapter 4 with the Jesus Project 365. Now, the first half of this chapter, we talk about Jesus being tempted by the devil or Satan or Lucifer, the wimp, whatever you want to call him. But it talks about how Jesus was led by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Uh, the temp now, what's interesting is that there are some people that say, well, that 40 is like a magic number. Um, it's not a magic number uh, because that would be witchcraft. Jesus was being obedient to God. And if God tells you to fast for one day, two days, three days, whatever, then be obedient to him. But we can't say this is a magic formula. Oh, if I fast from something from 30 days, I'm going to... You see what I'm saying? If there's still sin in your heart and you're still catering to the sinful desires of the flesh, it doesn't matter how much you fast or weep or moan or whatever. If you're still caught up in false teaching and sin, uh, this isn't going to change you. I mean, it might change you how the devil wants you to be changed, but it's not going to be Almighty God. Uh, the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And what's interesting is that Satan automatically goes uh, to the flesh. And, you know, oh, you're hungry? Ooh, let's satisfy that, that desire. Yeah, let's do that. Because Jesus was hungry and he was tempted. He was fully man. So he, he's been through everything that we have. He's been tempted in every conceivable way. And Jesus comes back with, with what? The word of God. He says, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He goes straight to the example. Now, that you might say, okay, well, obviously, you know, everybody knows that. But then look at the second, the second trial. It says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Ooh, it is written. So here's where the devil tries to get, get sneaky with Jesus, and he brings scripture out. And it's amazing how many American Christians are kind of under the illusion that, that the enemy will not use scripture, that false teachers won't use a lot of scripture or false prophets. They do. I mean, look at what Satan did in the Garden of Eden with, with Eve. He used scripture and he just twisted and tweaked a little bit of it. But this is what he says. He says, uh, throw yourself down for it is written, uh, you know, that the angels, that they'll lift you up and, you, you know, your foot won't even hit a stone. See, what he's trying to do, he's trying to trap Jesus with scripture because he realizes, oh, he answered me in scripture with the first one. I'm going to throw this at him, you know, to see if he'll, he'll go against another part of scripture. And Jesus says, he goes, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, this was kind of like a pride thing. If you really are, you know, I double dog dare you. If you really are the Son of God, prove it. Hoping that Jesus might say, you know, gosh darn it, I am Jesus. I am the Son of God. And go through with it. But Jesus understood it's the, the pride of life. That's what Jesus was coming against, the pride of, of his position. But he wasn't. He was humble and he submitted to God. And he says, you don't put the Lord your God to the test. In other words, Jesus wasn't going to have anything that dealt with pride because that would be sin and would separate him. And then his sacrifice would be useless. It says, the devil took him again to a very high mountain and showed him the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said, all this I will give you. And he said, if you will bow down and worship me. It's interesting because... In the Garden of Eden, way back when Adam and Eve blew it, uh, they sinned against God. They were kicked out of the garden. And basically, they were, they were given authority to run the world, to be watchers over it. And they sinned. And they turned that authority, basically kind of turned it over to the enemy. Because it says there's other parts in Scripture where it talks about how the enemy is, is uh, the ruler of this world. And that's why, as we are called strangers and aliens in this land, because the world and its cravings for the sinful flesh, the sinful desires, all this world has to do is with the enemy. So that's why we're aliens and strangers, because when we turn to God and we follow him, we ask forgiveness and confess our sins and all that stuff, 
we are no longer citizens of this world, but we're, we're, our citizenship is in heaven because that's where our inheritance is. Uh, so he, and Jesus said, away from me, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So Jesus, I mean, that's the first commandment. Jesus goes, Satan goes right to the heart of the matter saying, hey, I know God gave you the world. He's going to give you the world, but I want to give it to you earlier. Isn't that interesting how false prophets and false teachers will, will try to sidestep uh, discipline and the time it takes to grow mature in the Lord, and he'll sidestep all that. That perseverance, the trials of constantly seeking God, examining ourselves, and, and looking to Him in His Word, and casting off the old flesh, and walking with Him in righteousness. That takes time. It's a process. Like Paul said, we have to run the race to win. We have to endure to the end. But false teachers and false prophets, they'll do the same thing, and they'll say, they'll, they'll, give it, they'll try to give it to you sooner. Well, here's what I'm going to do. You can get this anointing. You can get this fire. You can get this gold tooth, jewel junk. Something is totally not of God. It's biblical, but it's, the, it's old stuff. And that's how Satan gets in there is he offers stuff quicker, faster. But the thing is, it's not of God. Anyway, the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Uh, as we continue on through the second part, it talks about Jesus begins to preach. Uh, prophecy was fulfilled by Isaiah. Uh, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And it's near. The reason it's near is because it, it was getting to the point of where Jesus was going to die on the cross. And after he was resurrected, guess what? Bam! Bam! Once that sacrifice was acceptable to God and people would repent and confess of their sins and they would be forgiven of their sins, they now had, had fellowship with the Father, that Jesus would be in, be in them and they would be in Him. And then if you've seen, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And He, he gave us the Holy Spirit and all those things. Um, but it's just amazing. Repent. The main message, repent. Remember, all have fallen short of the glory of God. And this is uh, later on in verse 18. Jesus was walking beside the sea, called Simon Peter and his brother. Uh, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net. He calls them, uh, and at once they left their nets and followed him. They left everything they had to follow Jesus Christ. Now, what's interesting is that they didn't leave their wives. They didn't divorce their wives. They didn't abandon their children. They didn't do none of this crazy stuff that some false prophets and false teachers are suggesting that, you know, well, I laid everything down for God. Even my believing wife and kids, God told me to do it. No, it's not in Scripture, okay? That's that pick-and-choose theology that the enemy loves people to, to deceive people with. Uh, it goes on, it says, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John were in a boat preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Now, the thing is, we have to remember that God calls us, and God is a priority. But God will never tell you to sin. He'll never tell you to divorce because it says, the word says that, that God hates divorce. And to not put away your wife and not, and uh, we see other scriptures that talks about those that abandon their children. Uh, it's worse than, than an unbeliever. So if you run across these false teachers that are involved in these weird kind of teachings, you know, and oh, well, well, God didn't tell you, so you're not supposed to marry that woman. That is a huge red flag, okay, because obviously they're not listening to the real God or the real Jesus Christ that we see here in the Gospels. Said it went on, and he's healing the sick and the and the, the epileptics, the paralytics, the demon possessed, severe pain, uh, those who were ill with various diseases. Large crowds gathered. People just went all over, and they followed him. Jesus healed them a hundred percent. He didn't leave them with symptoms. He didn't leave them hanging, uh, partially healed, uh, kind of like the gold tooth little thing that they got going on these days. No, he healed them one hundred percent. And that's another thing to watch out for with these false teachers and these false prophets that bring this deceiving message is that it's totally opposite from what God brings. So anyway, that's it. Take care. God bless. Peace.